All right, so I'm going to pick up here at the top with what is an ionic bond. Depending on what period I have you, either fourth or sixth, we may have gotten farther than this point. If that's the case, you can just fast forward through the video until we hit the new stuff. But if this is new, if we did not get to the what is an ionic bond part yet, um, go ahead and kind of pick up here and we'll just kind of take it one bit at a time. Okay. So what is an ionic bond? An ionic bond happens between two things that we should be pretty familiar with now. It happens between a cation and an anion. And here's what I want you to think about. So we've learned about how different atoms will either gain or lose valence electrons to satisfy the octet rule. You've discovered kind of the, the hidden patterns in the periodic table that all alkali metals always lose one electron. All alkaline earth metals always lose two valence electrons. So an ionic bond happens when we get ions close together. And here's an example that I want to give. Let's think about sodium and fluorine. So what I would like you to do is take a moment, you can pause the video if you want, look on your periodic table and figure out what movement of valence electrons these two elements will have. So find sodium, find fluorine, and tell me who's going to lose electrons, who's going to gain electrons, and how many. All right, so hopefully you saw that sodium has one valence electron that I'm just going to abbreviate VE. Fluorine has seven valence electrons that I'm going to also abbreviate VE. So if you think about it, this is like our perfect pig farm story, right? Here's fluorine with seven pigs. Sodium has one pig. The productive farms have eight pigs. So the easiest thing that's going to happen would be for sodium to give its one valence electron to fluorine. So once that happens, I want you to think about what's going to happen to the charges of these things. Sodium has lost an electron to become a cation. It will now have a plus one charge. Fluorine has gained one electron to become an anion with a negative one charge. And I want you to think about what's happening here. Think about what you know about magnets, right? So here we have a positive charge and a negative charge. When we bring these things close together, it's like that old Paula Abdul song, right? It's the opposites attract. So let's write that in there. Opposites attract. Ooh, it's going to be a little cozy. Opposites attract. So we see that sodium and fluorine come together in a compound and they stick together because the positive sodium is attracted to the negative fluorine and that opposite negative positive interaction is what brings these things together. All right, so for the second part, how to write an ionic compound formula. Now sodium and fluorine is a pretty simple example, so I want to make it a little more complicated just because it's a better indication of what we're working with. Instead of sodium and fluorine, I would like us to go with magnesium and chlorine. So again, what I'd like you to do, pause the vodcast, take a look at your periodic table, figure out what the charges of each of these will be, and really do it. Don't just wait for me to say it. Actually pause the video and do it. Okay, so hopefully you paused the video, looked it up, and found that magnesium ends up with a two plus charge, chlorine ends up with a negative one charge. So here's how I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this as a number line, like in math class, right? Where zero's in the middle, and we have like positive numbers in this direction, and we have negative numbers in this direction. Now the goal of every compound is it wants to be electrically neutral. It doesn't want to be positive or negative. It wants to just be right at zero. So I want you to think about how this magnesium and this chlorine are going to have to come together to make that happen. So if we start with magnesium, now magnesium has a two plus charge. So we can think of that as going like if we start here on our number line, that's going to take us two positive towards the right. 
but we don't want to be in the positive direction. We want to end up right at zero. So let's start adding some chlorines because chlorines are negative, right? Those will take us back down towards the left. So here we have one magnesium that took us that way. Let's add a chlorine. So Cl is a minus one, so let's add a chlorine. That's going to bring us back to a negative. Actually, it'll take us towards the left one space in the negative direction. But look, see, if, we're, if you look where we are, we're still at positive one. That's not where we want to be. We want to ultimately end up at zero. So what do we have to do? We have to add another chlorine atom because the two negative chlorines will cancel out the one two plus magnesium. So our final formula would be Mg Cl2 because we need two chlorines to cancel out our one magnesium. Now, I want to show you a little trick that I like to call um, the crisscross, and I'll show it to you how it works in a second, but let's go back over here to our A, B, and C and kind of fill in some steps. So to write an ionic compound formula, the first thing that you do is you determine the charges, which is what we did up here. Determine the charges. So we knew that magnesium had a two plus charge, chlorine had a negative one charge. The second step is a bit of a shortcut. So rather than thinking your way through this little number line up here of, okay, magnesium takes us two positive, and then we need two chlorines to go back to zero. If that makes sense for your brain, you can think about it like that, but there's a little shortcut that I like to do. And I call it the crisscross. And for that, what I mean is here we have magnesium with a two, what number do we automatically assume is with this negative sign up here? We assume that there's a one there as well. Well, look what happens. So if we know that our final formula is MgCl2, we can take these superscripts, these numbers that are up here, and we can just switch them like that bring them across and down so that that one comes down here and the two comes down here and we're left with MgCl2. That two went from the magnesium and it came over to the bottom of the chlorine. So that's a little shortcut that I like to call a crisscross. So um, if you like it, use it. If not, think about the number line instead. The final step is that we write in the lowest ratio. And here's what I mean by that. I'll show you another quick example. Instead of magnesium and chlorine, let's go with magnesium and oxygen. Take a second, look up oxygen on the periodic table. What's its charge? Negative two. So let's, instead of magnesium and chlorine, let's think about magnesium and oxygen coming together for our cation and anion. We determine the charges. For the crisscross, we take a two up here and a two up here. We go boopy doop, boopy doop, and we're left with Mg2O2. But to be in correct form, we write it in the lowest possible ratio. So if there are two magnesiums for every two oxygens, the simpler way to write it is just as MgO. Okay, now that we've gone through these examples together, look at under here under the triad section, what is the formula for the ionic compound that would form between, and then I give you two examples, barium and phosphorus and sodium and nitrogen. So what I would like you to do is again, pause the tape, um, try it, and then check back in once you're done and you can check your answers. All right, here we go. Barium has a two plus charge as a cation. Phosphorus has a three negative charge. So if we do our um, crisscross step, that two is gonna come down here, that three is gonna come down here, and our final formula should be Ba3P2.
sodium and nitrogen. We kind of lather, rinse, repeat. We have Na plus, N3 minus. Take the numbers. Remember, there's an invisible one here that we don't write, but we always assume is there. So we take the three, we take the one, they switch places, and we're left with Na3N. All right, how'd you do? If you're still having trouble with this, we're going to be practicing this a lot next class, so don't sweat it too much. The very last piece of this ionic bond puzzle is how we name things. And the naming is actually really, really easy. And you probably already kind of know it in your head without actually being told, which is always fun. So to name ionic bonds, and remember, we're talking about ionic bonds when we have a cation and an anion coming together. So for ionic naming, it's a two-step process that's actually really easy. To show you how easy it is, let's look at this example right up here. Na3N, the compound that would be formed if a sodium cation and a nitrogen anion came together. The first step, really, really simple, is we look at the metal. Boink. Sodium is our metal. It's an alkali metal. Step number one is that we name the metal. And I think my M has like one too many squiggles in it, but just ignore that. So in this case, the name of our metal is sodium. Awesome, awesome. Step number two is that we name the nonmetal, or in this case, the anion. But we change the ending, and this is the fun part. We change the ending by adding three magic words three magic letters, to the very, very end of it. Anybody have a guess? Those three magic letters are I, D, E. So instead of saying nitrogen, we would say nitride. And your ear will begin to learn what sounds right and what sounds wrong when adding IDE onto the ends of things. So again, don't worry about it. It's kind of like learning how to speak a new language. So in the case of sodium and nitrogen, the correct name would be sodium nitride. Let's look at this example up here and apply the same rules. Step number one is we name our metal or our cation, and that would be barium. For step two, Phosphorus, we need to change the ending, and the correct way to do that in this case would be to call it phosphide. So the compound that those two make when they come together is barium phosphide. So you'll notice the next thing on your notes says, now bond with a classmate. That obviously we can only do in class, so you can skip that part, and we will tackle that the next time we meet in class. So the next level of ionic bonding has to do with polyatomic ions. And polyatomic ions are ions. They're usually anions, but not always. Ions made up of more than one atom. Ions made up of more than one atom. So if you look down on this chart down here, you will see some common polyatomic ions. So up here, these are the charges of those ions. If you'll notice, we have a plus one, and then a minus one, minus two, and minus three. Most of these are anions. We have one cation polyatomic ion, that's ammonium. But over here, these are all anions. And that's how we're going to usually treat polyatomic ions. Most of them are always going to be negatively charged. So we treat polyatomic ions the same way that we would treat anions in that they'll follow the same rules regarding finding the charges, doing the crisscross, and all that stuff. But we need to add something when we're working with polyatomic ions. And in order to show you, um, I'm going to show you an example and kind of show you one right way to do it and one wrong way to do it. And I want you to see if you can guess which one it is. So for example, let's take, how about barium hydroxide. 
So this is the name of the compound. So barium, you're going to find on your periodic tables. That's Ba, and it has a 2 plus charge. Hydroxide is a polyatomic ion, and boop, there it is right there, an oxygen and a hydrogen that together have a negative 1 charge. Now, if we follow our, our steps, we've written the formulas, found the charges, the next step is to do the crisscross. And I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you two ways that we can crisscross. One of them is right, one of them is not right. So take a look. Option one, here we have, remember, our invisible one is going to come down here. Our two is going to come down here. So we have BaOH2. This is one way to write it. The other way is BaOH2. One of these is right and one of these is wrong. So take a second, think about it. Hopefully you decided that this one is wrong. And here's why. This two tells us that there are two hydrogen atoms, but we don't have just two hydrogen atoms. We want two hydroxides. A hydroxide is an oxygen and a hydrogen. So in order to communicate that we need two of each, we use parentheses. And this is like the distributive property in math when you put parentheses around something. This is the same as saying something like two times x plus y that 2 distributes out to both components. Same thing up here. That 2 tells us we have two hydrogens and two oxygens, which is exactly what we want to see. So let's kind of take a look. The best way to do this is by doing some examples together. All right, I wanted to zoom in here so we could um, really see what's going on. So here we are with barium carbonate. This is our first one that we're going to try. So let's follow our three steps that we learned about on the previous page. So step one is we write the pieces. So we have Ba, which has a two plus charge, and then carbonate, you're gonna have to look on the polyatomic ion chart. Now, this polyatomic ion chart, we're going to be using pretty much for the rest of the year. You do not have to memorize it. I will always give you this polyatomic ion chart, but you're going to need to know how to use it. So as wonderful as it is, it's no good unless you can actually know what you're doing. So barium carbonate. We've written our two components. Here are the charges. We're going to do our crisscross. So our two comes down here. This two comes down here and let's write what we have. We have Ba2CO3 2. Now I'm forgetting something. What do I need? I need parentheses. There we go. So that parentheses tells me that I need two carbonates, not just two oxygens, not two O3s. There's one last step though, and it has to do with the fact that both of these are twos. We can actually write this in a simpler fashion. Our final step is to write this in the lowest possible ratio. So if this is a two and that's a two, we can actually get rid of both of those and write this as BaCO3. Let's try the next one. Sodium sulfite. Sodium, let's look on our tables, Na plus. Sulfite, we need to look up here, it is SO3, 2 minus. Same kind of thing. Do your crisscross. Here's our 2. Boop. Our invisible 1 goes boop. And we have NaSO3. Now notice I did not write, oops, sorry, there should be a 2 there, Na2. If you'll notice, I did not write parentheses around my SO3, and that's because we only have one of them. Why do we only have one of them? Because there's an invisible one right here that travels down. If we only have one of a polyatomic ion, we do not need parentheses. If you put parentheses, it would be wrong. Let's try one more. Calcium nitrate, Ca2 plus. 
look on your polyatomic ion chart, find nitrate, NO3 negative, do your crisscross, and we're left with CA with a 1, right? But we don't write that one. NO3, 2. And what do I need? Parentheses. Okay. For the next three, these are, basically, you just have to name it. And the naming follows the same rules that we learned before. So for KOH, the first step is we name the metal. This is potassium. And then for naming polyatomic ions, it's even simpler because the name is always given to you. So if you look on your chart, find OH. It has a negative 1 charge. That's going to be hydroxide. So we don't have to change the ending. It's already done for us. Potassium hydroxide. Let's look at the second one. B and then SO4. B, if you look on your periodic table is boron. So four, again, look on your polyatomic ion chart, find it. SO4 is sulfate. And then last but not least, AL is aluminum. And then CRO4, find it on your chart. There it is, chromate. Again, when we're dealing with polyatomic ions, we do not need to change the ending. It's already done for us. Some polyatomic ions have an ending of ide. Some have an ending of eight. Some have an ending of ite. It's different for different ones, but that's the idea is that their names are already changed for you. So all you have to do is look and name it. All right, with that, you are all done. Good work, and we will continue with this in class.